Gilda Bell Morris, who uh, was the, used to be the executive director of My Sister's House and now works at uh, Stutter Health. And she's going to talk about um, how we need to support women in violence and hate against Asians. So, um, well, get started. Thank you, Terry, and thank you, fans for or fans for having having me here today, and thank you all for being here today. I know that there are many things we all could be doing, and so I appreciate that you've chosen to be here. And I hope that we will have fun together this hour, and hopefully leave with some thought-provoking thoughts, uh, but or have at least a great discussion. And so, with that, we'll continue. So uh, currently I actually work for Sierra Health Foundation and for those of you that aren't familiar with Sierra Health Foundation, we're a, a philanthropy, we're a, a nonprofit organization which helps give money out to help great causes uh, and I'm lucky right now because I get to work on stopping the hate issue uh, against Filipinos and other Asians and actually other underserved communities too. Uh, but for those of you familiar with the history, it started because especially with a lot of um, anti-Asian rhetoric that was coming from some national leaders when COVID started. I mean, the reality is racism has always occurred, right? It's always been with us, but it especially intensified uh, when COVID started again. Uh, and so um, Asian legislators uh, had enough pull and commitment in the state to set aside a block of money so that some nonprofit organizations throughout the state could work on trying to prevent hate against Asians, uh, and that includes Filipinos. I also had the privilege of working for my sister's house, which is based in Sacramento. Uh, those of you in, Sac in Stockton, uh, we have helped folks from Stockton, we've helped folks from even Fresno and further like up in Humboldt because we are the only or domestic violence organization in the Central Valley that's focused on helping uh, Asian Pacific Islander and other underserved women. So we're the only culturally responsive domestic violence shelter. And what that means is we are really committed, or my sister says is committed, I need to work on stop using we since I'm not officially with them anymore, <laughs> but committed to uh, helping provide domestic violence supportive services to uh, victims of domestic violence and other human trafficking victims uh, in a way that's culturally responsive. Because the reality is when people aren't comfortable getting for help, whether they be male or female, what happens? Like if, if you go somewhere, you want to go get a haircut, and you don't feel comfortable with a person who's supposed to be working on your head, or you want your car fixed, and you don't feel comfortable with a person that's providing, meeting you at the door, what happens? What, what, what's our human nature if we're not comfortable? To leave. To leave, right? We leave, we walk away, we don't get the help, or maybe we get the help for a little bit, but not the help, that all the help that we really need. And that's why culturally responsive services are really important. So because it takes a while for people to, to deal with issues, right? especially if they've been uh, traumatized for a while, right? It takes a period of time to begin to heal uh, and to begin to have the strength to rebuild their life. Uh, and that's why culturally responsive services are important. The other reality, too, is that oftentimes people don't know where to go for help when they, um, especially if they're from underserved communities, right? Uh, and so it's the commitment of organizations that work with, you know, that specialize in working with underserved communities. It's that commitment to that outreach that helps make, that connects the dots so that those who don't always get help get the help that they should be getting from what we would call mainstream organizations, right? Um, so I've been lucky. I was able to work with my sister's house for 18 years. I just wrapped that up as we celebrated our 20th anniversary uh, and now get to work on stopping the hate. Um, and I also get to work, recently I started working with Sierra Health Foundation on, on behavioral or mental health issues. Uh, and again, uh, Sierra Health Foundation's commitment is on addressing race and equity issues. So the mental health perspective is how do we expand the services for um, folks, especially folks that look like all of us in this room, 
to uh, receive the mental health, the recovery services uh, from people that know what it means to be a person of color. Right? So I'm hoping that, um, you know, as we talk, I'm going to make some points, and then I will also want at the end to, uh, for you to ask questions, and you probably can even ask questions during. I'm, I'm pretty easygoing. Uh, so why and how our Filipino community needs to support its women? Oops, went the wrong way. So three reasons, I think. Uh, first, policies and programs. Second, funding. And third, representation, right? Uh, I, th I think Stop the Hate is a, a perfect example of policies and programs, okay? Uh, and these first slides are just an example of where, um, uh, where and how we have seen hate against Filipinos. Uh, and often it's not discussed, right? Because, you know, we don't want to talk about being a victim. Uh, we're afraid that we might uh, encourage others uh, to be hurt or, you know, that we might ca cause greater hurt and shame to our families. Uh, and we actually need quite the opposite response. And this is the story of an uh, elderly Filipino woman uh, that was um, assaulted as she was on public transportation in San Diego, which is the San Diego trolley. And this is February 21. Uh, an identified man just went up and punched her uh, for no apparent reason. Now, uh, she was treated at a local hospital, etc. Um, so again, sometimes people will say like, oh, this incident, well, that's just somebody being cruel and mean. But this is really about, you know, and, and that's one of the hard things about uh, hate crimes, right, or hate incidents, is that you don't, we don't know, but we suspect that this is because she's a short person, woman of color, that was attacked. Uh, and an, an elderly woman at that, and uh, in between March 19 and December 31 of 2020, 7% uh, involved Asian Americans age 60 and above. So 7% involved Asian Americans, um, so that were 60 and above. That meant that a lot of incidents were for 60 or 59 and below, right? Uh, which is good news. Uh, it's really not like people fear that it's an elder problem. In reality, the problem is like 60% of the incidents involving hate crimes have been with women. And that's the fact that's like not mentioned enough, that it's the women that are being uh, impacted the, the most because of hate crimes. Right. Just out of curiosity, has anybody been involved in a hate incident? You ever had a hate incident? Any kind of hate incident? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm happy to pass the mic if somebody wants to share. I also want to be respectful if you don't want to share too. I'll share my, my most recent one that I th think is the most recent one. Uh, so I was at a, a, a newly open shopping area in Sacramento in one of the richer neighborhoods, right? Uh, and if you know me, you know I like French fries. Next to Starbucks, I like French fries, right? So I was at Five Guys going to place my orders and eat my French fries. Uh, and this man, who admittedly might have been on drugs, or I'm not sure, but he stopped me and said, you know, hey, can you read this? You know, I'm of the age that I have to pull out glasses to read small print, right? Uh, and so that's what I was doing, and he said something like, you know, you can't read English, why don't you just go home? You know? and and. He, granted, he didn't, he didn't threaten me right then and there, right? But I'll tell you, I felt threatened, right? Because it's, he's a man, he's bigger than I am, or he was bigger than I am. I don't know what crazy stuff he had up his sleeve. Yeah. And there was nobody near me to, to yell at. I mean, it was daylight. Family, don't worry about me. It was daylight. <laughs> but, you know... Um, you still have to deal with it, right? 
And that was the hate incident that I encountered. What is it, the world, you know, was it a bombing? No. But it still is an incident that, like, obviously still impacts me today that I can recall it. And I remember feeling it. And I also remember thinking, like, what was I going to do about it? Like, right, afterwards? Like, what, what, you know, what do I do? Right, what should I have said? Do I walk away? I remember those feelings like yesterday. And I don't know if anybody else wants to share a story, and you don't have to if you don't want to, but I wanted to leave it open. I know it's, it's hard, and I appreciate you sharing that you, you have, you know, um, does anybody know? I mean, we shared those who felt like they had a hate incident. Has anybody feel like they know someone who's been worried about having, uh, being a victim of a hate incident or a hate crime? Okay, here almost more, right? Like, you know, I know you, we have to worry about our elders going out right uh whether they live with us or are far away you know it's the the times that we're in and as as covid gets worse and as the national leaders come on board as recently you know uh in his in the recent talk of uh, the candidate who declared presidency whose name i'm not mentioning purposely you know he made already some anti-asian hate incidents in his talk in his declaration uh, so this was a woman, this is a story about a woman in Vallejo who was attacked outside Jollibee uh, in Vallejo, uh, near, yeah, so she, he was with her family and then in this particular case she was fighting, trying to, she didn't give up her purse and so then she fell to, to the ground. And I think most people, most law enforcement people will tell you, like if you're in a situation like that, don't fight, right, just, just, it's just, a purse, it's just a wallet, let it go, it's not worth the, the human injury. And unfortunately this time she was hurt because she did try to pull up a fight. I found it interesting, and I know this is true for other cultures too, but this is a time we got to start doing something about this, right? This for me is like so disrespectful, right? If you pull up, you look up, you put in the uh, internet, which is what I did, like Filipino women, what do you find? You find like meet Asian women slides. These are different uh, internet postings of dating services of Filipino women. And I just feel like, why aren't we having meet Filipino women that these women names are on there, right? That these are the names that should be up there of like what accomplishments that they have, that we have, the history that they have, and not dating sites, right? And this is the problem with the dating sites, as uh, knows from her work with, with trafficking victims, right? A lot of, as we know, a lot of relationships, there's nothing wrong. I know there are some happy marriages, happy relationships from internet dating. But for every happy marriage, there is an unhappy, exploited woman out there whose partner, or whose, I don't even want to call him partner because partner sounds 50-50, who's uh, the person that they found in the dating service uh, has lied to them about who they are, what their intents are, what their intentions are, and then hurts them physically and emotionally, right? Uh, and oftentimes, especially in my belief, because Filipino women know English, because again, most tend to be small, uh, and because we still have, we grow up with a culture still of, you know, of commitment, of uh, faithfulness, of, uh, you know, marriage, that they are easy victims to bring over to the U.S. and to be exploited you know, to be exploited physically, again, and sexually, right? That's why I've, I've always felt in my years of my sister's house that um, traffic victims from, for Filipino country, from the Philippines, sorry, that were Filipino, uh, were, um, came because, uh, you know, for those reasons, right? They, here they thought they were marrying someone wonderful. I remember one of the, the Filipino women uh, that I'm thinking of right now, um, she said, like, 
look, look on the computer here. My, my husband is already looking for another partner. We're not even officially divorced yet. And why did she come? Uh, she came because her husband was, you know, uh, actually wasn't on a dating service, but had gone on one of those vacation services, right? Had gone to the Philippines, and then he brought her over here to the U.S. Uh, hurt her physically, hurt her emotionally. Uh, and here's the thing. He was in law enforcement. And he was already looking for another victim uh, so that he could exploit, right? And hurt. So we need uh, to pay attention to women issues, to our Filipino women issues, uh, because there are statistics that are unique to Filipinas, to Panay women, right? Uh, and granted, not all Filipino nurses are women. I've had male, wonderful male friends that are nurses, but most of them are female. And Filipinos make up 4% of nurses in the U.S., but a third of the deaths, a third of the nursing deaths, are from uh, COVID-19. That's huge, right? And we need people to cry out to say, hey, what's happening here? You know, and, and what ways can we be safer? What do we need to do about it? What education do we need? And wh what's wrong with the system that there are weird outliers like that? Because this should never happen, I think. You know, you shouldn't have screwed up statistics. You should have statistics, I think, that reflect what the community looks like, but you shouldn't have statistics that reflect that a third of the deaths are from one specific community. And you need community members, and it's, it has to start with us, right? My dad would always said, like, right, that it has to start with us, be, and we have to help ourselves before others are gonna help us. So, and especially shouldn't happen when you figure that Asian Americans, which we're under as Filipinos, that we're the fastest growing racial and ethnic group for the U.S. We're, we beat Hispanics. I mean, here in California, we think a lot about Hispanics being the number, the fastest growing population, but it's not true. It's, it's Asians. And half of us live in the West. 15%, actually this number says 17% of the population in uh, California are Asians. So because I uh, was a former athlete, that means one out of eight people in the state are Asian Pacific Islanders. One out of eight. So if we're going to do something, the odds of something and needs to be addressed should be done in California. Right? So six Asian groups make up 85% of all Asians. And of all Asians, Filipinos are almost 20% of all the Asians in the US. So one out of five uh, Asians are uh, Filipino. So in, um, uh, at my sister's house, uh, I was the only, there's a hundred domestic violence organizations in California, a hundred plus, and I was the only Filipino of all the domestic violence organizations, the, leading the, all the domestic violence organizations. And there weren't that many domestic violence colleagues that I had that were Filipino. Right, so still a lot of work. And when I do the work in nonprofits, there's, there's not a lot uh, of us. Uh, and I also want to definitely encourage that in terms of a service that can be provided. So this slide says that we grew, our Filipino population grew 34% during the last decade, mirroring our Asian American uh, growth rate. So again, people think uh, Latinos are going to be the majority population, which is true, but um, uh, we still have the fastest growth rate, 34% uh, compared to Latinos at 28%. 
and this slide echoes the, the cities that have the highest uh, Filipino population rate. Um, so it includes Daly City is number one, Hercules number two, and these are uh, in California, uh, Carson number three, uh, National City in San Diego number seven. Guess what number Stockton is? 52. Your eyesight's better than mine. <laughs> So 5.3% of the population. In terms of the US cities, 133%. So and as I was prepping today, I um, was able to, I mean, I learned so much. Thank you for having me here just to learn about the city's history. I just loved it. And, and the, as I learned about the city's history, I knew I was also learning about our Filipino-American history, right? And so glad that my father-in-law, uh, Bert Val Morris, is here, who was born uh, part of uh, Stockton's history. Uh, anyway, um, this is the site of the Little, Little Manila Center, uh, which actually is also one of the recipients that I'm working with under our Stop the Hate Asian grant. So you guys could be the second recipient from Stockton if you guys apply. Not that I don't have, um, it's a process, so I, I don't want you to think that I can magically make it happen, because I can't, okay? <laughs> but uh, assuming you all did well in the process, you could be the number, uh, the second group in Stockton. Uh, the first quote there was just uh, five years ago before COVID, right on the windows of the Little Manila uh, Center. Uh, was written in the, you know, the spray paint, the white property, your brainwashed bigot. And five years ago just doesn't seem that long ago. Um, but it was interesting to learn that the history of Filipino violence in the U.S. began in Stockton, right, on New Year's Eve in 1926. And then again, you know, talking about programs and policies and why we need Filipino women and granted Filipino men to, to be involved, or all men, uh, 1960s, 1970s, you know, this place was bustling with, with Little Manila area and that was destroyed due to city policies. And so you need people who are committed and educated you know, and this, yes, this has happened to other underserved areas, like this happened in Sacramento, too, with its Asian population. But it just means that we need more people that can pay attention uh, and speak to what's happening with our policies, with what, what's affecting our underserved communities. So let's bring it up to, to a real issue, of, uh, or up to date. So these are pictures of, uh, what do you notice about these pictures? People of color. People of color. What else do you notice? Men. Four men, right? Thankfully, four Filipino men who have made the, the ballots, won their elections. Uh, the guy on the left is the first Filipino in all of uh, the Northeast so we're talking New York, we're talking Massachusetts, uh, Rhode Island, et cetera, that was elected to a statewide position. The first one ever, right? Uh, Rob Bonta, who I think we all know and love for Attorney General. Um, and then uh, the second to the right is a, a city council member, Ali Cantos, who it also is uh, physically challenged. Uh, visually challenged so it's um, so I'm so impressed that he won I mean I, it was nice to learn about him uh, and then in Los Angeles for the first time ever uh, was uh, Kenneth Mejia he beat the incumbent who was elected like three times uh, and became the first API official uh, in over a hundred years Um, sure, if I can figure out how to do that. Do you know how to do that? <coughs> Sorry. Presentation format. You Thank you. I thought you were going to tell me you knew him. 
<laughs> Thought you were going to tell me you were related to them. <laughs> uh, also this year, um, what do we notice from this slide? Asians. Asians. Women. Women. And where are they making an impact? East. On the East Coast. Also at the state level. At the state level, but on the East Coast. Yes. I'm like, and some of them in Rhode Island. I'm like, shoot, Rhode Island can elect Asian women? Why can't California? So uh, currently, point less than 1% of elected leaders in the U.S., even though we're like, I think that number is more like 8% now of the population. So less than 1% even though we make up 8% of the population. That's the picture. Thankfully in our region we do have, I don't know if you know these two, these are two wonderful uh, Asian women, uh, uh, Sacramento City Council member Mai Vang who's Hmong. And then uh, she just declared victory. Uh, Assembly member Stephanie Nguyen, she's an Elk Grove City Council member. Uh, so she's the new assemb Assembly member. Uh, and um, she's Vietnamese. So programs and policies, how does it make a difference? Uh, as part of her campaign, this was a close campaign. Right. Yes. For Stephanie, it was a very close campaign. And one of the things that she did is she publicly made a promise to the Filipino community to help build its center, to help build its, uh, a Filipino center. She said, you know, I'm, that's going to be one of the first things I do. So now the Filipino community has to make sure that it keeps, keeps her accountable. Uh, that she does it. And I'll tell you, there's a lot of pressure like on the Filipino community, okay, I'm making this promise, now what are you going to do to help me get elected, right, was the, the back side of that, right? So we're not just talking about like that people in this room have to run for office. We're also talking about that people in this room and outside this room have to make sure that the right people get elected who are going to do the work, hopefully, and be the voice that we want to hear. So in, down in LA, in a town of about 10% Filipino, uh, this woman was elected as the first Asian American female member. And nearby, there was the first Filipino council woman in, uh, in 30 years. I don't have her picture, but she is elected too. So I brought this, this picture, up, this timeline up. And the reason why I put this timeline on, you know one of the things that the, I told you that the um, Hmong community had elected Mai Vang, not just the Hmong community, because in fairness to, to Mai, she's elected by many people, and she's wonderful, and she serves the needs of all, right? I mean, she really does a really good job at that. But what I want to say is I know that the Hmong community gathered together so if you notice, they've only been here like 20, no, well, from 1975 to 2000, 25 years, right? So 25 years here, learning a country, being the poorest of the poor, and they got somebody elected, uh, a woman uh, in Minnesota on a statewide position, 25 years which is, what, two generations. Not very long in the period of time, in the period of history, right? Since then, there was a Hmong Elk Grove City Council member who was, uh, well, I just said he was Hmong, he was male, but uh, Hmong, and then there's this, the, the uh, city council member from Sacramento, and there's others. What they did, and why this slide is up here, is that they, their community leaders, sat together and thought, how do we get more power in the U.S.? How do we get our people represented? How do we get programs to serve and funds to serve our people better? So my argument being like, if the, the, the poorest of communities can strategize and work together to get people elected to be their voice, we as Filipinos who have been here the longest, we need to be able to get together and get our people elected 
or people who can speak for us and speak for, with us and for us. Oh, so now I have to, and now I can't do it because I can't see the slide. Thank you. Thank you, Terry, for, my family will tell you how technically challenged I am. After falling victim to yet another possible yes. suicide, Sivan Willis tells us in this exclusive report, the family was not only verbally attacked, do it up here. was physically assaulted as well. A simple restaurant in North Hollywood, California on May 13th turned into a traumatic experience for a Filipino family and possibly a hate crime. This is this year. The incident began after 10 p.m. at the fast food drive-thru when a jeep bumped the Roque family's car. We went to a drive-thru um, and as we were about to get our food, um, someone bumped the back of our car and we immediately went ahead and called 911 and our dad to help us. And it transpired more after that. You know, what started out as a minor traffic collision um, escalated into something more dangerous and more uh, something that we never would have expected. The family was then verbally attacked and threatened by the yeah, other driver. I saw a shot. Yeah, you fucked your car. Oh, you. I saw a shot. Saying, I'll kill you with, um, well, mocking a uh, uh, racist stereotypical accent, uh, Asian accent. Patricia's father, Gabriel, arrived a few minutes later. then turned physical toward the 60-year-old and his wife, 47-year-old Marissa, as seen in these videos captured by the Roque family. I heard a lot of this in chat, and I didn't want to do it. And then, I was really happy to say that the words that are not good, that are about Asian things, something like that, that I didn't want to do it because I was scared. I was scared, especially because I was with my daughter. And then, I was scared to say that I was scared to say that tapos dumating sa point na mihinga kami ng tulong pinawagan ko yung husband ko then pagdating ng husband ko um, pinipilit niyang pumunta sa kotse para uh, buksan para kunin yung daughter ko and then pinigil siya ng husband ko and then bigla na lang niyang sinutok yung asawa ko and then bigla na lang siya napahiga and then of course tumulong ako and then pagtulong ko while well, bystanders tried to intervene and police eventually made their way to the scene, the incident has left the Roque family in physical and emotional pain. It's traumatized. It's hard because it's different when you're in the family. The people we see on the TV, we think we think that 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 we think I think we can stop it now. Actually, he's supposed to hit me and then I even know that was to my mother. Thank you. And and I put this in there because this just happened May of this year. Right? This just happened May of this year. And just wanna make sure that this goes back to the uh for me of like there's a lot of, of racism that unfortunately still occurs and we need to make sure that we strengthen ourselves and others around us to be able to speak up I'm so proud so glad that this woman ha and her family even as, as though they were traumatized spoke up about it because others need to speak about it because what happens is if people don't speak about it they're gonna think like Nothing ever happens to our Filipino community. We live fine out there. We're living good lives. Nothing ever happens. They don't need war. They don't need any assistance. Why are we spending money with a community with a group that doesn't need any help? 
because if people aren't speaking out about it, that's the impression that is left. Okay. So that's the public problem, and then there's the personal problem. Just like with domestic violence survivors or human trafficking survivors, or I say victims until people get help. When they get help, then they become survivors. Right? In the meantime, if they're not getting help, then they're dealing with the issue by themselves, and, then, and because they're not speaking out, they're keeping it inside, uh, and however difficult it is, and it takes a lot of, it takes a lot of energy to keep it inside. It takes a lot of strength to keep it inside. But getting the help that you need, that people need, that's where the, the healing begins, right? The, the possibilities to rebuild the life in a different way, to stop the pain, that's when it happens, when people speak up and speak out, right? And we all have a responsibility not just to help the victims, but I think also to stop abusers, whether they be the government, systemically, or individuals, right? And, and hurt can come from females, too. It doesn't just come from uh, males, right? I remember growing up, I think one of the reasons that I got into the work of, of my sister's house uh, is that uh, my Lola, who lived with us as a good first generation family, you know, immigrant family would, right? She, uh, I would talk to her lots. I loved her. Still love her even though she's in heaven. Uh, and uh, she would say to me, um, you know, Nilda, you, to be a good wife, you got to take whatever happens to you. You know, if your husband cheats on you, you got to turn the, your cheek. Uh, if he hits you, you just got to accept it. Right. Um, and I remember telling her, like, I think I was somewhere between eight to ten years old then, and like, you know, that's not going to be my story, Lola. You know, that might be your story, but that wasn't going to be my story. And thankfully, with my wonderful husband, that's, and I'm not just saying that because he's here right now, but, <laughs> um, you know, that that wasn't my story, right? But I remember her saying that, and that certainly like marked my life, right? Uh, and I actually vowed, I remember vowing, I told my husband this, like, I vowed not to marry a Filipino guy because I didn't want to worry about that stuff, right? Um, uh, but but I, and I also remember when I was, uh, just a few years ago, uh, um, I was at a Filipino scholarship dinner, and this young woman who's like 18 years old and Unfortunately, I'm getting to the age that I could have probably been her grandmother, uh, but she said, she went up stage, on stage, and she thanked people for the scholarship, but she also told them a similar story that I just told you. And I thought, oh my God, attitudes in our Filipino community and our Filipino families still exist like that today, right? That this is what it means to be a woman, that we have to be strong enough to put up with crap you know, and I'm like, why? Why, why should we? Right? Uh, this is not good for us, our children, and, and even our, our partners. Uh, um, even if those partners think that they mean well or do well. Oh. So speaking up, I think, is really important uh, and helping others to speak up, right? We have to make sure that our young women, that if they want to run for office, that they should have the, uh, the courage and the capacity to do so. Uh, and other ways to help include your time and your talent, right? Uh, helping behind the scenes uh, with your skills uh, is really important. As, you know, the, the people behind this museum, their time and their talent. Can you imagine how many like, people come in, uh, the, the several thousand that come in a year, to think about like, where they came from, what it means to be Filipino. I mean, what a gift that is to be able to, uh, in applause, big applause to those that are behind this museum for making that happen. Uh, and then, of course, your treasures, uh, especially uh, money, if working for nonprofits is always a big help. Uh, in, you know, every little bit I would always say like helps, uh, and it does, right? Because no one wants to do the fundraising. So those are my quick thoughts for the day. I'm kind of open to your thoughts and your questions that you might either that you might have about uh, my sister's house, uh, nonprofit life, me, whatever. 
the thoughts that I just said. Are there any questions that some of might have? Or thoughts? Please, thank you for sharing. I'll just give a comment. I, I thank you. you sharing um, what this brought for me. My mother, you know, she came to this country and experienced a lot of, you know, I thankfully was not in that position, so it's hard for me to relate to her, but to hear her story. She was a nurse's assistant, you know, prejudice, all those things, and it cuts very deep. And over the years, I've learned to just listen and appreciate and, and honor her story and her experience. Um, and you know she's you know very supportive of me. Thankfully, I've been in positions of power of authority, so I haven't had that experience. And I, you know, I tell my daughter the same thing. She's she's half Mexican and half Filipino mix. And I said, honey, you're very lucky. I said, I hope to God you never have to experience. And I tell her, listen to your Lola. You know she's you know she's trying to teach you something and all of this. So I appreciate the work you're doing to surface these issues and make it known because there are others out there who need to understand that there's. Um, safety and, and numbers and experiences and you know just to give that safe psych psychological safety to the, the issue. So thank you for your work. Oh, thank you. And it's all our work, right? Uh, you know, in our families and in our greater community. Go ahead. If you need to. She did great work, I'm sure. <laughs> so, but I'm saying she grew up on Highway 12, right there. Mm -hmm. it, and I think I think you bring up a really good point of inclusiveness, right? That yeah. at the end of the day... As opposed to the, if you, you look at me, 
And I'm the person that you should hate. I mean, I, that's who people will, will come to. Black people, look, I have a brother, you wouldn't recognize him. He looks like a white person. She's seen, but I don't. So I'm a guy that's kind of afraid. If there is an aura that, you know, uh, black people, well, well, they're the ones that have studied. They, they, they can recognize Filipino people. That's not easy. You see my wife's sisters? Not easy. But to create an aura that, and I know, it's going to come down to, they say Black Lives Matter, yeah, they really don't when you can recognize them. And I'm the guy that's sitting here that, that you're afraid of. I, 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 I'm the guy. Well, um, I'm not sure that, that in this room that people are afraid of you. I don't, I'm not going to speak for myself, but I'm certainly not uh, afraid. There probably are definitely others outside this, the doors that might be afraid. And they're afraid not just of you, they're afraid even of Filipinos, right? Uh, and so we're all in this, in that sense, we're all in this together. Right, and it's really important, I think, and uh, you bring up a really good point of, I think, of, of as communities of color that we need to support each other, right? That there are issues against blacks, there's issues against Latinos, there's issues against Muslims, you know, um, uh, many underserved communities because people don't accept them for who they are or who, and who they want to be. And we should be trying to, to support each other. We need to support each other. Uh, but definitely also I think in our own Filipino community and history that we know how much infighting that occurs within our Filipino community that we don't support each other in our own Filipino community that we can't achieve some of the goals and some of the progress that I think our Hmong community members have achieved because of our both our, our lack of support for each other, other Filipino groups, and also our um, uh, lack of working together, right? But we definitely need to be more, uh, we will need to be louder in our voices on immigration issues and on anti-hate issues affecting all. And I should say the Stop the Asian Hate Crimes, I actually have NAACP that I work with as one of my projects also. Um, and so they're in the priorities for this coming round uh, actually are on other communities. Uh, I am concerned because like Filipinos is not one of the communities that is prioritized even though I think statewide there's only two groups of I think like the 80 projects that are supporting the Filipino population. Right, and so um, definitely a lot of work that needs to be done. And I think that there's ways to do the work in uh, in different, in unique ways. So what I want to say, for example, and this might be a project that might be interesting for fans that we do in my family, thanks to my niece Joelle and her husband Torin. Um, and we have, you know, after uh, um, the George Floyd incident happened, you know, the, our younger generation said, what can we do about this? How can we address this issue within our own family, right? And that's something I think like conservative members that I thankfully have become a little less conservative and, um, um, and I, th I feel like it's really changed their minds. And we basically hold a virtual book club. Uh, and so once a week we talk about, you know, different books. We've picked a book or we've picked a movie and we talk about um, the, the book, the chapter. We take turns facilitating the discussion and we talk about racism. You know, we talk about racism in the book or the movie and we talk about it in our own lives too. And I think that we have really grown as a family together and on this issue so that we can also be more articulate and comfortable 
uh, at work or in our, our public lives, right? And, and when I say public lives, I don't mean in terms of like professional life, but I mean just like even going to the store and finding the strength to deal with whatever issue that might come from facing a stranger. You know, someone talked to me to mention one time about like parking their car and feeling like that the, that even just the parking the car incident was there was somebody that was being, you know, racist and judgmental towards them, you know, commenting about their driving and what country that they were from, et cetera, right? You know, and so the, the even those incidents, right, can impact people and and, and if we're, we don't pay attention, we can just ignore it and say like, oh, that person's just having a bad day or that person's just stupid. But if we ignore them all the time and then maybe that they really are reflective of a bigger issue going on that we need to get some public funding for to support groups to do this work to say like, this is not okay. The racism is not okay. We need to strive towards more inclusiveness, as you said. Come on. So I think that tension is still there in terms of needing to address the anti-Asian hate. I'm worried with, the, again, the public uh, candidates coming out and with COVID stats getting worse again, right, that the, that the problem is going to intensify. And I also further worry, though, because I think that there are less Asians that are in the state positions to be able to make a difference. Because some of those elected officials that put together the Stop the Asian Hate that supported it have moved on to, you know, maybe because of term limits, maybe because they got a, you know, like one's working in the San Francisco District Attorney's Office, or is this, you know, so they've changed positions. So the, the positions of being able to access the money, they're not in that position anymore. So there's going to be less numbers. So I am concerned about how long, you know, the support is going to be there to address the issues. Right? And so again, an argument for more voices, and they don't necessarily have to be Filipino voices, but we need to make sure that there's enough you know, energy to, uh, so that others that are not Asian, that do have the power, will, will say something, do something to help the causes. Do you wanna say something again? Or? We have, we got maybe a couple more minutes left of battery. Okay, so. <laughs> that's a good, that's a good stopping point. Is there any different, anybody else who may, may not have asked a question? Yeah, Do you want to? I was to say, uh, when I mentioned the positions that my wife had for a Filipina to move to those positions, to have those positions, to be in those positions during those time periods, that time period, uh, there was a lot of racism to go through. I'm sure she paved the way. Was there, yes. She was there. The same racism. Whether she can speak to that, she doesn't. Black Lives Matter 
was that there was diversity in the support all over the world. That was phenomenal. Yeah. That that happened, and look what happened. Well, look what can happen if people get together and talk about these things and figure out together what we can do so all of us can move forward. Yeah, and I think that the Black Lives Matter movement helped bring some philanthropic dollars to uh, local grassroots organizations, right? And, and those dollars probably wouldn't have gone to them before. You know, it's people protesting, it's people making comments, it, that's what, what triggers our, our philanthropic world to act, which then triggers, in my mind, the corporate world to act, right? And, the, and our state to act, too for our government to act. So with that, we'll call it a day and we'll, we'll all together do something in the next weeks, right, and be thankful uh, for all that we have. And I'm thankful for all of you for being here today. Uh, and it's, it was great meeting you. I hope to see you again. Hawaii, so we're still getting that.